Uh, today I'll talk about some parts of Scholar that I haven't actually talked about much yet at all. Usually I talk about trying to find articles. Because that's what Scholar was when we launched it. To make it possible for everybody, no matter where they were, to be able to find what anybody else in the world could. Okay, um, we made a fair bit of progress on that. Today I'm going to talk about a different side of Scholar, which is once it's possible to find the work, what do you do next? You look for other papers by the same author, you look for other bodies of work, you look for related things by the same author. Science, in the end, are all of scholarship, really, nothing specific about what's referred to as science, is centered around its practitioners. Quality in all the work that do is done comes from the people. We do it all the time, we do it unconsciously when we are evaluating new research. As editors, we look for reviewers. As funding agencies, we look for people, investigators, we look for reviewers, all of which based on who has the expertise in this area. Using the authors then either directly as a search result or as a mechanism to pivot from what you have already found to others that which may be of interest to you. So what does it take to put scholars on Google Scholar? The hard problem, the truly, truly hard problem is to figure out what papers a particular author has written. The publication process over the years has prized brevity over clarity. It's often you see a acharya losing all information as to which of the at least 25 acharyas that I know was this article written by. Who do I pivot to? Is even multiple of them in the same area. First step is to figure this out and figure this out for everybody. What is for a services to be useful? It needs to be figured out for everybody. Next, you figured it out once. You need to be able to keep it up to date as people's research interests change, students graduate, move on to completely different postdocs where they work on completely different things, be able to maintain the continuity in publication as all of these transitions happen. On the flip side of the challenges, there are opportunities. If I know what your research interests are, and that's what your publications define, heck, I can understand what you, what you really like. What, what kind of work, what approaches would be of interest to you? And then, as I am scanning the entire web for newly published articles, can I find the ones that would be useful in your work? And the second is, of course, what people need to do is, if I need to find an expert in an area, can I do so? I mean, I've had people from industry ask me the same question. I've had people from the government ask me the same question repeatedly. Can you have a collection of scientific articles? Can I find me the right person that I'm looking for? Maybe. So I'll talk about three different parts. Let's see how far I get. If I run out of time, please do let me know. Um, the, spend some time trying to describe how we go about the problem of author disambiguation. It's one heck of a tricky problem. More, we have spent more effort on this than practically anything else in Google Scholar. The challenge is to be able to set up an author's profile quickly. Indeed, just like that. And then be able to maintain. Or putting it differently, it must be easy enough for a full professor of 25 years vintage with a lot of publication and no time at all 
to be able to set it up and keep it up to date. So the second is how do we make it easy for people to find this? You built this, now what do you do? The purpose of building any such thing is to make it possible for people to find based on that profile. And finally, I'll talk about personalized recommendations, which is what I talked about, what I said is the opportunity. Can I find you papers that are likely to be of interest to you? For the disambiguation, we built a statistical model looking at every possible dimension there is. We look at co-author lists, we look at journals, we look at co-publications, we look at co-authors, research areas, affiliations, citation patterns, text of articles, what have you. We build a multi-dimensional multi statistical model shooting for high precision, which is I must be right, but a very good recall, which means I need not always get every single article by this person. It's okay for me to create two different groups or three different groups of articles for a given person, I will describe why that trade-off allows this difficult problem to be approached in a, in a reasonable way. The reason why this is necessary is people over their lifetime work in very different areas with many, many different co-authors and different communities. If you try to group all of those things together, you end up collapsing completely unrelated things by people with the same name. If you allow these groups to remain different, it's very easy for the author himself or herself, if you present it in the right way, to identify which papers are theirs. So from the point of view of setting up a profile, collapse, the final collapsing with the author is a really simple task, is a recognition of what I wrote. Hey, I know those well. If I can bring it down to the point where you have to do very few steps, this trade-off allows this very hard problem to be somewhat tractable. So how does it work? We present, whenever a user tries to set up a profile, we show them groups of articles that we have, the statistical model has identified as belonging to the same author. The author selects one, two, three groups, and that's it. Mostly, for most people. Occasionally, there may be mistakes. You may need to merge a few. You may need to delete a few. It does happen. Especially if you happen to share a name with a very, very prolific author. That said, once you're set up, updates are automated. For most people, five to 10 minutes. The changes, if you make any, get fed back into the model, which allows the model to become more precise going forward, which means the changes too are often a one-time step. So this is to give you a feel for what it looks like. The query being Acharya, we group it into different Acharyas. There are many more. The fun one are the last two. The second one, of course, because it's mine, always the most interesting thing. But the next one is my classmate. Same name, roughly overlapping areas. The challenge is to be able to separate them out. In this case, we have one per author. Sometimes we have multiple. For me to recognize which of these are mine is trivial. It's 10 seconds. I click on add all my articles, I'm done. What do you get if you did put those 10 seconds? You get a list of all your publications. You get citation metrics overall, over all your articles on a per article basis. It's variation over time. Links to co-authors. You can follow cita citations to all your papers together. When anybody cites you, you can be informed about it. Colleagues can follow your work. And finally, which I think is actually the really cute part of it, we can find you papers that you may not otherwise find. So give you to show you an example. This is what Professor Nye gets. You see his papers. A lot of papers, overall citation stats, citation stats over time, his co-authors, ability to follow citations or articles. If you click on the first article, this is what you would see. So on an individual article basis, you see the information about the article, and the citation information is related to the article. So, so far, so good. 
demo or the sample case works well, which is always the first step. How well does it work? The only answer to that is how often people use it, and people use it a lot. All, most authors take a few minutes and they opt for automated updates. They set it up, mostly they're done. All over the world, all areas. It has been overwhelming success. I'll show you some examples here. Say, for example, authors from the United States in the Edo domain. The reason why I'm showing you, I can show you the number, but you can see how well cited they are, which gets me back to my original goal. If an author with hundreds of publications can set this up quickly, it must be working. This is in UK, not to say that it's US centric. In Italy, again, the point is not to flash a large number of numbers, just to give you a feel for the kind of people who find it, who are able to use this technology, this facility, to be able to get, set up all of these features for themselves. Why does it work? What allows it to work? The two parts, one is a careful building of statistical model, clearly, but second is the flexibility to split groups. That allows you to get much higher precision and the recall collapsing is very simple for the author to do if you present it in that form. Also, it takes one time, five, 10 minutes, you get lots of services from users, is well worth the effort. Pivoting to the second part, so you build profiles. How does it actually help you do what you're trying to do? Which is find people. So I'll show you some examples. We handle a variety of different cases, queries matching, that include names. So you have idea of some name and some other attribute of that person. You should be able to find people. You have just normal keyword queries. Can you pivot? Can you go from articles that you have found to other articles by that specific authors? Can you browse researchers in a research area, in a given area? So this is Professor, I'm sure I'm probably going to muck up his name. Artaxo, I think, yes, so. Professor Artaxo at USP, but in, you could, USP was just a particular keyword I chose, it could be one of his papers. You put in a name, you put in a keyword. It brings up link to his profile. It also brings up, if you look carefully at each of the search results, you will notice that most of the search results are linked. So you can click on either the first result that comes in or you can click on any of the author links that are in there. So you are just doing normal queries, you find results, we are linked it together, you can pivot in there, you can look at other articles by other directions the author has explored. You click on them, you arrive at one such thing. Now how do you actually, you, this gets you from keywords to authors or keywords to articles to authors. How do I get to authors within a search area? Well, we allow authors to self-identify one or more research areas. They do, we link them. So now you find, and you can see people from clearly, in VI, what I did was to simulate the clicking of the first atmospheric aerosols. And you're seeing experts who have identified atmospheric aerosols as one of their key interests. You can see they are researchers all over the world. Moving on to the third part of my talk, which I, from my point of view as a, as a researcher, on a daily basis, the payoff part of the talk. There's a huge challenge which everyone as a researcher has always complained about, not today. If you go back and read papers in 1946, they say the same thing, too many publications, I can't keep up. Um, that's the beauty of a hard problem. It's a gift that keeps giving. You make progress, it keeps getting better. What do we do? Our approach is centered around author profiles. We look at 
what interests as described by your publications and how they have evolved over time. We look at co-authors and how they have evolved over time. Thank you. We look at the citation relationships. That indicates what kinds of aspects of your work is of interest to some of the others or how it is being used in some other place. Using this, we build another statistical model, which you will see as a common theme in a lot of things we do, and then apply that model as we scan, as we build the index all the time. We scan the entire web looking for scholarly articles, and we apply this model to every article that we see. When you have a public profile, you come into Scholar, we show you a preview of your recommendations, we pick two articles, two recently public, uh, published articles, which we believe are of interest to you. Here what you're seeing are articles that are, are actually, well, hopefully of interest to my wife, who works on um, ALS. If you click on see more, see all, you will see a much larger collection. Now a challenge in doing recommendations is different people have different either tolerance for variation or how tight they want. Some people want stuff that is very close to their work. Other people are very worried about finding stuff only close to their work and would like to spread their net wider. So what we, if you look at the top right of the slide, you will see two buttons, top and all. What you're seeing here is top. My wife is a vet chemist. She actually does experiments. So you would see most of these things that are experimentally oriented. If, you, if I click all, you would see broader. If you look at the bottom two results, you would notice that they are molecular modeling or computer modeling approaches to ALS. Idea being to take what is core areas of your interest and give you articles from everywhere, or to allow you to explore the penumbra of your interests so that you can explore and gradually, as you get interested in those, move them back into your core areas. Finally, individuals, there is much structure. There are many entities in the scholarly communication space. Individuals are, of course, the center of it all. However, individuals are also the hardest problem because the degrees of freedom in terms of the number of articles and the number of potential authors with the same name is the largest. There are other entities, there are other aggregations, groupings that are of interest to many people, departments, institutions, funding agencies. These are, have fewer degrees of freedom. There are far fewer of them than there are individuals. And once you have solved, to a reasonable extent, the problem of disambiguating to individuals, the next layer of analysis can build on what is already there. Finally, uh, I'd like to point out what we present what I described here in terms of personalized recommendations, we believe works really well, but personally, I think it's just the first step. Finding what I need to read is the magical hard problem in this space. It's what my PhD advisor said was a hard problem. You can keep mining it, and it'll keep being hard for the rest of your life. Thank you.